and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. This has been a productive month for rejuvenation biotechnology companies, longevity researchers, and us here at Lifespan.io. Let's take a look back at what's happened in June. We've made quite a few additions in preparation for our upcoming Ending Age-Related Diseases Conference. Three more speakers have been confirmed, and the full program is up on our website. Sponsorships are also available. Make sure to confirm your spot now, and don't miss the digital event of the summer. Two new episodes of our Life Extend show have been released. One focuses on deregulated nutrient sensing, as old cells lose their ability to sense nutrients properly and the other focuses on stem cell exhaustion. You can find both of these videos on our YouTube channel and website. There are also two new episodes of our series, Science to Save the World, including one on viruses that explains how you can help scientists understand COVID-19 and viral pandemics without leaving your couch. Here's a taste of that. Viruses use proteins in various ways to infect and hack our cells to reproduce themselves. This is very much what SARS-CoV-2 is doing right now. These are highly complex structures, and they are too small for us to observe them in action. But can we use computers to simulate their interactions in order to help speed up the search for vaccines or other drug therapies? A virus is an entity that infects the living cells of an organism and can only replicate inside of those cells. Viruses can infect all life forms, including animals, plants, and microorganisms such as bacteria. They are found wherever there is life and have probably existed since living cells first evolved, so they've been around a long time. They are the most numerous and diverse type of biological entity on Earth and are found in almost every known ecosystem. There's an ongoing debate as to whether they are truly alive or not. Some biologists think they are alive because they carry genetic material, evolve through natural selection, and reproduce. On the other hand, they lack key characteristics of life, such as cellular structure and the ability to replicate on their own. Some deem them to be organisms at the edge of life. The host range is the variety of host cells that a particular virus can infect. This ranges from narrow to broad, as some viruses can't infect certain species, while some can infect many. A viral protein is actually both a component and a product of a virus. Viral proteins come in several flavors, including structural, non-structural, regulatory, and accessory. Medical science usually looks at the structural type. Most viral structural proteins are parts that make up the capsid and envelope of the virus. The viral DNA, or RNA, encodes the instructions needed to replicate the virus. The capsid acts like a shield that protects those instructions. It is also the part that attaches a virion, a virus outside a host, to a cell and allows it to penetrate the cellular membrane. Viruses basically break into a cell and use its machinery to make its own proteins. So the viral proteins are really the key to us understanding more about viruses and how to diffuse them. The function of a protein is determined by its shape, a three-dimensional structure formed through a complex process called protein folding, where it essentially builds itself. Since they are too small to be seen in action, one promising way for us to understand complex proteins in various states with other molecules is through computer simulations. But wait, there's another problem. These simulations can be so complex that the computing power required is enormous, and even beyond that of supercomputers. Enter Rosetta at Home. Rosetta at Home is a distributed computer network that uses the power of many computers around the world. An individual computer runs a part of the simulation while it's idle and then sends the data back. You can just chill while your computer is doing the work. With the recent COVID-19 outbreak and crisis, 
Rosetta at Home has been used to predict the structure of proteins central to this virus, as well as to test new mini-proteins to be used as potential therapeutics and diagnostics. Rosetta was recently used to predict the structure of a coronavirus protein before it could be measured in a lab. By offering scientists a glimpse of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, Rosetta provided a boost to efforts to develop drugs and vaccines against the virus. This protein is how the virus fuses its membranes with our cellular membranes in order to infect our cells. Rosetta calculated the 3D structure of this spike protein in early February 2020. The prediction closely matched what was found later in the lab. Home users' computers, like yours, were likely used in this calculation. Using this structure, researchers have begun designing proteins that would stick to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, preventing the virus from infecting cells. Work is now underway to produce these antiviral proteins, test how well they bind to the spike protein, and evaluate their efficacy as coronavirus drugs. So will you and your computer help save the world from COVID-19 and other threatening viruses? A second Science to Save the World video focuses on asteroid impacts, which you can hear now. We've all seen the movies, but what is the real threat of an asteroid impact? Humans have a hard time thinking about large timescales, making it even harder to plan for distant or potential events. If you can back up and think on a time scale of the universe, we're a shooting gallery for asteroids. It's only a matter of when, not if, another one will hit Earth that could cause a mass extinction. Let's rewind time a bit, shall we? The Chicxulub crater was formed by a large asteroid or comet of about 11 to 81 kilometers in diameter. The date of the impact coincides precisely with the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary, slightly less than 66 million years ago. A widely accepted theory is that worldwide climate disruption from the event caused 75% of plant and animal species on Earth to become extinct, including all non-avian dinosaurs. A far more recent impact that happened just over 100 years ago was the Tunguska event that occurred near the Podkamenea Tunguska River in Russia in 1908. Thankfully, the explosion happened over the sparsely populated eastern Siberian taiga, yet it still flattened an estimated 80 million trees over an area of 2,150 square kilometers. In more modern times, the Chelyabinsk meteor was a superbolide that entered Earth's atmosphere over Russia in 2013. It was a 20-meter, near-Earth asteroid with a speed of around 65,000 kilometers per hour that streaked a bright trail in the sky. The object was not detected before its atmospheric entry. Although there were no deaths, about 1,500 people were seriously injured by indirect effects such as broken glass from windows blown out from the shockwave. We may not escape so well in the future. So, what needs to be done? How can we prevent another event? The first step is finding the asteroid. We can find them mostly through telescopes by seeing an object that changes or streaks through a background of stars. Once we've found them, we then need to track them. This is done by collecting and analyzing multiple images from telescopes over days, months and years to begin to understand the trajectory and orbit. We then need to categorize the asteroid. This is done by size, spin rate, material, and if the object is actually two objects, a binary pair. Okay, right, but how do we actually stop one if we see that it's on a collision course with Earth? Deflecting is a final step, and contrary to Hollywood, blowing it up with a nuke is not the best resort. The most feasible idea is to fly a spacecraft alongside the asteroid and let the gravity of it change the asteroid's orbit enough over time to avoid Earth. This is called a gravity tractor. A more direct approach of this would be by slamming a spacecraft right into the asteroid in a more aggressive attempt to knock it off course. For either of these methods, if you affect it early enough, the slightest nudge will make a huge change over time. Another method being researched is by using lasers. This technique involves many small spacecraft, each carrying a laser, swarming around a near-Earth asteroid. 
The spacecraft could precisely focus their powerful lasers onto a spot on the asteroid, vaporizing the rock and metal and creating a jet plume of superheated gases and debris. The asteroid would become the fuel for its own rocket and would slowly move into a new trajectory. Obviously, none of these methods has ever been fully used or tested, but some missions are being looked at right now to potentially test them out on benign asteroids. So, despite the reality of Earth likely being hit one day, the good news is that we've reached the technological point at which we can respond to this. After all, dinosaurs didn't have a space program. Now is the time to prepare and be ready. So, how can you help save the world from an asteroid impact? If you have a telescope, check out Asteroid Mission. If not, check out Hubble Asteroid Hunter. If you would like to get involved with protein folding at home, or in the search for asteroids, please visit our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup to find out more. And now, our research roundup. A team of researchers based primarily in China has found that a lack of NAD is responsible for mitochondrial dysfunction in egg cells, leading to decreased fertility with age. This study builds on previous research, making it clear that NAD plays a critical role in aging at the cellular level. However, this is a mouse study, and the effects of NAD precursors on human fertility have not yet been tested. Speaking of NAD, Researchers from the University of Helsinki have concluded a human trial using niacin, a form of water-soluble vitamin B3, and have shown that it can increase the presence of NAD. Participants in the trial saw a decrease in whole body fat percentage in controls and increased muscle mass in both the control and the study group. After 10 months of niacin supplementation, the patients demonstrated improved muscle strength. The researchers also observed that hepatic fat was halved and visceral fat was reduced by a quarter. Also worth noting, the price of other precursor supplements that may increase NAD in humans are very high compared to niacin, which is cheap and readily available. Niacin has also been shown to have the potential to be useful against brain cancer. Researchers at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary have shown that niacin, combined with chemotherapy, spurs immune cells to attack glioblastoma, a type of brain tumor. This resulted in significant slowing down of the disease progression in mice, with untreated mice living for just 40 days, while mice given the combination therapy living for 150 days. Glioblastoma is a highly aggressive form of brain cancer, and there are currently no fully effective solutions to it. Typically, people with glioblastoma die within 14 to 16 months of diagnosis. During this mouse study, there was a significant increase in survival time. However, researchers will need to confirm dosage, delivery, and length of time as part of a properly controlled human trial before we can know for sure if these mouse results translate to people. It is known that advanced glycation end products, or AGEs, tend to accumulate in our bodies with time and play a pathogenic role in the development of various age-related diseases such as diabetes, atherosclerosis, and Alzheimer's disease. Now, a group of Japanese scientists has found that AGEs tend to also accumulate in osteoblasts, inducing apoptosis. This mechanism likely contributes to the development of osteoporosis. The discovery can lead to the development of new osteoporosis treatments based on existing and yet-to-be-discovered AGE inhibitors. Senescent cell accumulation is a likely reason we age, but according to a new study published in Cell Metabolism, removing some populations of specialized cells that have turned senescent may have negative consequences. The study indicated that the elimination of certain senescent cells in the liver disrupted blood tissue barriers, causing tissue fibrosis and health deterioration. In a recent study, researchers from the Buck Institute have shown that cellular senescence, one of the hallmarks of aging, is partially responsible for Alzheimer's disease. While senescence is difficult to detect in neurons, due to the fact that mature neurons do not divide, senescence may be a critical part of the Alzheimer's cascade. The researchers claim that this cascade may be responsible for much of the brain cell loss associated with Alzheimer's. This could explain the failure, or at least very limited success, 
of treatments that solely focus on amyloid proteins. If the researchers are correct in that cellular senescence is responsible for, or is a major part of, the Alzheimer's cascade that leads to dementia and death, a combination therapy of senescent cell removal and treating tau and amyloid pathology at its root may be effective against Alzheimer's disease. Researchers from the laboratory of Dr. Vadim Gladyshev at Harvard Medical School and in Silico Medicine joined forces for a new study which analyzed the data from 13 studies on the human gut microbiome and aggregated it to see if developing an aging biomarker clock based on the microbiome was plausible. The team trained a deep neural network using over 1,000 microflora samples, and the resulting clock predicted the age of the person with a margin of error of 5.9 to 6.8 years. The findings support the idea that the microbiome does change in a somewhat predictable manner in the context of aging, and that it may be possible to refine the clock further for much higher accuracy. A new study published by researchers at Scripps in the journal Nature Biotechnology has shown how the gut microbiome of mice can be reset to a healthier state using specific peptides. Perhaps most exciting of all, resetting the microbiome significantly slowed down the progression of atherosclerosis in the treated animals. Treatment with the peptides shifted the balance of bacteria in the gut microbiome, which reduced cholesterol levels and greatly slowed down the accumulation of fatty deposits in the arterial plaques. That's it for our research roundup. For more information on any of these topics, visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup. To close things out, we'd like to point out that the world is still reeling from the COVID-19 pandemic, which has had both severe economic and humanitarian effects. According to published data, risk of dying from COVID-19 increases exponentially with age, rising from 0.2% at the age of 20 to 8% at the age of 70, a 40x increase. Perhaps it's time to consider how aging research and rejuvenation therapies could stop the next pandemic from killing anywhere near as many people as COVID-19 has, and to put more focus into this work. On that subject, I will be speaking at the Humanity Plus post-pandemic summit a free digital event taking place on July 7th and 8th, 2020. My talk will focus on my efforts with a new nonprofit organization, the Human Augmentation Institute, which was founded to uphold bodily autonomy and ensure that any efforts in human augmentation are done ethically, safely, and responsibly. Visit humanaug.org to find out more. I'd also like to announce that Future Grind is working with a space robotics company to enable people to send their digital files and photos to be immortalized on the moon in support of the first commercial lunar landing in history. To find out more and to send your own files, visit futuregrind.org forward slash moon. That's futuregrind.org forward slash moon. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast.